I got Chick Ray's invitation about a year ago, and he said he was putting something together. He was introduced to me by a friend. And actually, I never met him. He was an online friend. So I actually said yes to the invitation based on my close friendship with the person who introduced us. And I was actually foolish enough to think I was doing him a favor. <laughs> you see, because most of my life, I've always been viewed as an appendage doesn't matter what I've done or how hard I've worked. When I was born as a premature baby, I was born to a family of um, extremely successful industrialists. I was almost embarrassed when I was watching Mocky's movie earlier on because I knew so many people that were on it. And so I was viewed as my parents' daughter. After being viewed as my parents' daughter, I was educated very, very well at probably the best schools in Nigeria and abroad. So I was then viewed as a product of that particular teacher or that particular school. And in fact, I was the sort of product that was a good advertisement for the school. I did everything I was supposed to do. I lent my verses. I could speak in public. I could run. I could jump. I could swim. I could play the piano up until grade five. So people would say to me, where did you go to school? And I would tell them, and there would be a rush on that school immediately, because they wanted their daughters to be like me. And the values that were held up as very good values at that time, I used to revel in my superficiality. I could um, pick up a magazine, and I could order an outfit in my size from any country in the world with great skill, and it would arrive within two or three days. I was also intelligent. I went to a school where, because the books were imported, you couldn't take them home because they couldn't afford to lose the books. So I picked up a photographic memory very, very quickly, and it stood me in good stead later as a lawyer. I had a close relationship with my father, very, very close. Um, contrary to popular Yoruba culture, we could table any topic at our table, and we could speak about it, and so long as we could justify ourselves. So my parents always told me that I was so small when I was born that I made up for my lack of size, because I had three brothers, I was the only girl. I made up for my lack of size by developing a loud voice and being very, very feisty and almost owning the space in which I was in, despite being the smallest and the only girl. And they used to ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I used to answer confidently, I want to be a queen. And it used to make them. <laughs> And it used to make them laugh because, um, well, it, perhaps it wasn't so funny because there's actually royal blood in my family, but I would have to have um, stabbed three boys in the back before it got to my stage. <laughs> and I used to spend Saturdays with my father. We had a tradition in our family on Saturdays. On Saturdays, my brothers would go and play football, and my mother would go to the hairdressers, and my father would go to his building sites. Now, as the only girl, I was supposed to go with my mother to the hairdresser. But I learned that it was a very painful experience, bending my head into the sink. And so I used to make sure that I was in my father's car at the time he was leaving for the site. And we would leave for site, and he would talk to his construction workers. And he used to give me a magazine to read. It was called West Africa. Quite dour and, you know, probably to most children of age five, a boring magazine. But I would sit in a corner of a construction site, staying out of harm's way. And I would be reading this magazine, not even understanding most of it. But it was all about development and economics and agriculture and whatever. I was used to reading anyway, because my brothers never wanted to play with me. So books were my best friend. And if life could be a textbook, my own life followed its predestined path. Everything was very smooth, and everything was wonderful. And I loved my life. My parents tried to foster a sense of charity in me. But charity in those days in our sphere was, you know, if um, I didn't wear all my clothes, my mom would say, oh, you have too many clothes, why don't you give some to charity? And I would pack them in a box and I would send them off to charity and I would feel very good 
about what I had done. And um, I came to school in England, again, a very good school. I graduated, I read law, and life was lovely. It never even occurred to me that there were real problems that could really truncate a person's life or slow a person down. And I remember I was 27, and I was excitedly getting ready for my wedding, and I was sorting out the dress, and my mother and I were arguing how many beads, you know, what level of sequence, and, you know, the guest list, and, you know, I wanted maybe 2,000. They insisted 5,000 people. So these were the problems of my life. <laughs> I have to say, looking back on it, I was very superficial, but I reveled in that superficiality. And I remember that um, I got pregnant slightly earlier than I should have done. But because I was small and I was slim, my mother and I figured it wouldn't show, and so did the designer. Six weeks later, first scan, it became evident that, well, it would show, because I was expecting twins. But even so, the designer, renowned designer here in the UK. I shan't call his name because he'd probably be embarrassed. He assured me that he could put in panels and everything would be okay. In the entire wedding preparations, the only one voice of caution I ever heard was from a dour old consultant who I had gone excitedly saying, oh, you know, I'm you know, flying to Nigeria and I'm having my wedding and these are the plans. And he said, you'd better be careful because you know you're expecting multiples. And I remember going home and telling my mother and like most Nigerian mothers, she said, God forbid. And I joined her. You know, we vilified the poor man. I never went back. I found myself a more amenable doctor who told me, of course you can fly and you can do whatever you want to do. You're going to be fine. Anyway, I never in my life read the footnotes of any book because all I had to do was read the book and absorb it and sail through life quite happily. On December the 6th, 1991, within 24 hours, I gave birth three months prematurely. I had twins, I lost one, and I got married, all in the space of 24 hours. My previously lovely life suddenly collided with the footnotes of life, and I suddenly saw a side of life which was never, as they say in my country, supposed to be my portion. In that harrowing period, I really did experience what was never intended for me, and I was most unprepared. But what I experienced was an unavoidable reality for the majority of the women in my country. The inadequacies of the Nigerian health system, the lack of reliable information, the absence of an effective referral system, and sometimes, comically, the deplorable attitude of our health workers. On the third day after delivery, which I think most women who've had children, um, let's just call it engorgement day, I was lying in the bed and still thinking, oh, everything's going to be all right. You know, my dad's going to come in here in a minute and he's going to tell me the ambulance plane is here and I'm going to be whisked out and yeah, everything's going to be lovely. A midwife came into the room and she said, your baby needs milk. I was educated, so I knew that you know, breast milk was important for babies and even more so important for premature babies. So I looked around expectantly, waiting for the pump, for the breast pump. You know, they have these lovely ones they show on TV where you put in a battery and you hold it and you're listening to Mozart or whatever. <laughs> and she gave me a large white plastic bowl. So I looked at the bowl and I looked at her. And I said, what is this for? And she said, start pressing. <laughs> so I gave her a sidelong glance, which probably only Yoruba people would understand, where you look to one side and you look back at the person, hoping that something would have changed. <laughs> and nothing changed. She was joined by two more midwives who leapt on me and started to press. I will spare you the gory details of the howling and crying that ensued. A couple of days later, it became um, my turn to learn about what the textbook meant by blood transfusion and what the reality in my country meant by blood transfusion. The doctors arrived for their morning session and they said, your baby needs blood. 
And I said, oh yes, I know I'm B positive. And they said, yes, but your husband is A positive. And where is he? At the time, my husband happened to be visiting his father who was in political detention on some island slightly off the coast of Lagos. So the search began for another member of the family who might be A positive. The issue of a blood bank did not arise. We're talking about 1991. HIV had just become a reality. Even if they had offered me a blood bank, I would not have said yes. Because I wasn't your typical Nigerian, I didn't know that in your last three months of pregnancy, you're supposed to be bringing members of your family to come and give blood and be storing that blood ready for your pregnancy. Anyway, the call went out to members of the family and they all started trooping in to the hospital one by one to be tested. I remember being very upset actually because my father refused to come to the hospital to be tested. I didn't realize he was just scared like most men are. <laughs> in such situations. <laughs> anyway, a kindly aunt was found whose blood group was O and she agreed to give her blood. At which point I quickly started racking my brains as to what relationship she might have had in her life because really this was going to be um, an arm-to-arm -arm transfusion. So I started praying to myself and thinking, my goodness, I hope she hasn't sort of had any irrational impulses because this is my newborn baby <laughs> and I want my baby to survive. And like many people in such a situation, I turned to God, I turned to prayer because I didn't have anything else to turn to at that point. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and my promises to God escalated to fantastical proportions <laughs> of what I would do if he would just spare the life of this child. Because we were talking about 1991, a 1.2 kilo baby in Nigeria. Um, we did have incubators, but the power used to go on and off. So prayer played a very large part. And as well as praying, because I was very, very well educated, and I had a global network already between my parents, friends, and my friends, and people I'd met along the years, I also reached out globally from my hospital bed. So I heard from one person that there's a particular baby milk that has long chain fatty acids, and you know, children can digest it very quickly. I taught myself very quickly about global logistics, because one person had to go to a hospital, and you couldn't even buy this milk. It was given out freely on the NHS, so I even had to network to somebody who is in hospital already having a baby, who can ask their midwife, can we have two cartons? And then I found a courier company, they picked it up, they would bring it in. So I picked up a lot of skills from my hospital bed. But during this period, the union of faith and tenacity and medicine and education and connections, and then my conscience started to worry me. And I started to think, am I really that unique? Am I really the only person who this has happened to in my country? Or what do other people do? who don't have a satellite phone at their bedside. I'm talking about the very early days of GSM. Somebody mentioned then phones were like a suitcase. They were like a suitcase in those days. And I started to wonder what happened to other people in my situation. And I had promised God that I would try to help. So I started trying to help people. Initially, I started with charity. Each time I met somebody, and actually my story, whether I liked it or not, it made the newspapers. I remember. The day I brought my baby home from hospital, there was a headline in um, a magazine, what they call a soft cell, a tabloid. And some kind person had decided to deliver it to me at home in a plain brown envelope. And it said, the headline said, billionaire's daughter's bad luck. And I remember reading it, but my baby was still in hospital. So I tossed it aside and I focused on, you know, getting her the help that she needed and going to the hospital. And I remember one day meeting a woman who was just telling me about how her baby had stopped breathing once and what she'd had to do to get the baby to breathe again. And I remember thinking, you know, because I was still, you know, it's a slow process, self-development. I thought, well, that happened to her, it can't happen to me. 10 minutes later, I was in front of my daughter's incubator and I thought she was looking very peaceful. And then I thought, oh my goodness, her heart, is her heart moving? So with one hand on the incubator, 
I was calling with the other hand to the nurse, saying, please come and have a look. And the nurse, as per usual, were religious people in Nigeria. So she was saying, oh, no, the usual, God forbid, not your portion, by the grace of God, <laughs> Psalm, Psalm 121. And you know, when medics start calling God to you, you become very, very scared. And the nurse approached the incubator, and she screamed. And she screamed and shouted, Mrs. Taraki, go and call the doctor, go and call the doctor. So I flew out of the intensive care unit, down the stairs, carried a doctor, the first one I met, and I said, go and save my baby. And he flew up the stairs and you know, put something on her chest and you know, was starting her heart and then shaved her head and put a drip in her scalp. And then the little heart started beating again. And I realized the power of communication. And I realized that really to save lives, you have to have everything. You can't have just the hospital, or just the doctor, or just the health literate mother. You need everything. And so I started to work. But even so, I was doing it on a small scale. I called five of my friends. And once a year, we would organize a run, walk, or stroll. And we had sponsorship. And you know, we were society women, enjoying ourselves and doing good. And I thought I was keeping my promise. And then my husband became a governor of a state in Nigeria. And I went to live in a rural area, which I had, you know, before rural areas were for weekends. You know, you went to your lovely country house on the weekend and, you know, all the staff were there before you got there and they cleaned up the house and you had your, everything was lovely. And when you left, they locked it up. I suddenly had to live in a rural area. And because I'm the way I am, I didn't want to just live in government house and be waving at the people. I actually wanted to get to know the people and mix with them. I had once met um, my first development partner, actually, Maury Albertson of Village Earth, who told me that if you want to help people, you cannot just be bestowing help. You have to go within the communities. And the seed to the development of every community lies within that community. So they normally will bring out their solutions, and then you try and help them connect to what they need. So this was the attitude I took when we went to Kwara State. I was forever leaping into my car in disguise quietly or getting people to take me in theirs and going to villages and finding out what the people needed and what their own solutions were and then trying to modernize it for them. And um, I had a lot of programs. Some were government programs, some were my own. I, I felt finally that I was at the grassroots and I was happy until a friend I had made in Kwara, her name was Chenwe. And coincidentally, she was the wife of the Commissioner for Health. She was pregnant, she was educated, her husband was Health Commissioner, for God's sakes. And she was going for her antenatal, and all things were good. And then she went to visit her mother-in-law. And while she was at her mother-in-law's house, she went into labor a month early. She was taken to the nearest hospital, and she presented at the hospital, and they didn't have her health history. They just had her. And she was in labor, so she was in pain. They were trying to get her health history from her, and she was groaning with pain. So there was a life-changing delay of about 45 minutes. In that 45 minutes, her baby began, became stuck in a transverse lie, which is lying across. They tried to turn the baby, and they couldn't turn the baby they didn't realize that this child had actually been in a transverse lie before, and they had been trying to turn the child for weeks. She was trying to tell them, but she was screaming, and they couldn't understand. Anyway, by the time they realized that she needed a cesarean, they couldn't get the theater open because somebody else had had a cesarean three hours earlier, and the auxiliary nurses had cleaned the theater and locked the door and closed for the day. Chen Wei died with her baby in her stomach. The cesarean that she was denied in her lifetime was performed upon her when she was dead. The baby died too. Another thing they ask governor's wives to do in Nigeria is to visit the first baby of every new year. So whether or not you want to be in the papers or not, you're in the paper on New Year's Day. Someone like me who likes going on holiday, sometimes you're in the paper on the 2nd of January because you've had to dash back. 
to carry the first baby of the new year. You get to the hospital and they find the most beautiful baby that has been born that day. In choir, actually, it was quite amusing because I always got the sex wrong. Every time I saw a baby wrapped in pink, I would say, what a beautiful girl. And they would say, actually, no, it's a boy. You know? But I enjoyed going to the hospital to welcome new life and see the new baby of the year. And one year, I went to our state general hospital. It's called Sente Borough. And as I was carrying the new baby of the year, I saw another mother cry. And I said, why are you crying? And she said her baby needed a blood transfusion. And I said, so why hasn't your baby been given the blood transfusion? And they said, the hospital with the blood bank is, we can't get through to them. We've sent somebody by motorcycle to that hospital. So I dropped the first baby of the year and I carried the baby that needed the blood transfusion. And I said, let's go. And I noticed the nurses were giving me that same very Yoruba sidelong look, but I ignored it. As I was carrying this child, I suddenly felt a wetness. And that was when I realized that people pass water when they die. This child died in my arms, and the first sign of the death was the urination. Why? We had blood banks. We had the hospitals. Simple communication is what killed this child. I've seen babies die because their blood types were not compatible with that of their mother. I've seen children die because the parents can't pay the registration fee to access the free care in the hospitals. I've seen mothers die because a vascular surgeon is in the staff room next door, but the obstetrician doing the operation wants to sew up the vein he cut by accident by himself. I've seen lives lost because even in the same facility, they don't want to marry the health of the newborn to that of the mother. So they can't spot gestational diabetes when they see it. They keep giving the child glucose until the child dies because they didn't know that the mother was a diabetic. And yet, because of my experience, I've also seen the way systems that are supposed to work properly do work properly. I've seen the synergy of mother, child, system, doctor, <laughs> research facility, records at your fingertips. And I just wanted to know how to bring this synergy to my own country. I myself had three children after that. Very similar circumstances, hemorrhage before delivery, rushed into intensive care, but the synergy worked. Because first of all, I knew what was happening to me and I was busy telling them. And I was in a country where the referral system worked. Because of course, after my first um, experience, I didn't think of having another child in Nigeria. I have to be honest, I'm always, very frank and honest person. But it was on my mind, this promise I had made to God. And I couldn't work out how to bring it to my country. I couldn't even explain why people were dying in my country. Because like I said before, midwives, we have them. Doctors, we have them. Nurses, we have them. Health facilities, no matter how basic, we have them too. The mothers are health seeking. So why is it that our people are dying? And then I realized that the answer was at my fingertips, how to help them. There was this book that the health visitor in London pressed into my hands, whether I liked it or not, and warned me that I had to fill it. It was the personal health record book. And I realized that this was the crucible in which all the different systems met with the mother and also would let a mother know what her country owed her in terms of health care. So I picked it up and I went to go and look for the people who originally wrote it. I wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel. I just wanted to make sure that I could bring this sort of a similar thing back to my country. But then I realized I couldn't just copy and paste and take it back to my country. When I opened it, there was some um, advice on sunscreens, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to, for instance, change the advice on sunscreens to bed nets. I had to write an advice on tuberculosis. I had to write an advice on malaria. And in fact, when it said, where do you live? I wrote in questions like, do you live in a hut, a single story dwelling? Do you have an inside toilet or an outside toilet? And because I had been working at the front line for such a long time, I began to know the sort of data 
that people wanted to have and couldn't get their hands on. So I wrote all of this into the book. It took me four years. I was working with doctors in Nigeria, with health facilities, with the federal government, and it wasn't plain sailing because a lot of the doctors couldn't understand why this lady lawyer who just happened to be married to a doctor all of a sudden was telling them what to do to pregnant women and wanted them even to write it down. So sometimes I had to move by stealth, by charm, by niceness, and sometimes I admit I would pull rank. I remember one particular meeting where I wanted um, a health minister to meet with the primary health care development agency head, to also meet with the national health insurance head. And I phoned them and I lied to them that my husband wished to see them. <laughs> <laughs> when they arrived, I trotted my husband in and I said, please greet them because there's something I need to ask them. So he greeted them and he left. And then I closed the door. <laughs> I closed the door and I said to them, how much longer are you going to watch women dying? Because what you need to do to make the systems work, it's not rocket science. We just need to make sure that everybody is meeting at one melting point. And God so kind, they agreed. The health record was born. At the moment, there's two or 300,000 copies and they're running out fast in Nigeria. And the government has committed to actually putting this in the 22,000 primary health care centers in our country. Now, I haven't um, finished winning the battle yet, but I think that we now have a synergy where every single sector has decided to work together to make sure that our pregnant women and children are not dying. When I try to convince people, I use something that I learned about in the old days from reading West Africa. It's called the value of a statistical life. We don't know how to measure it yet in my country because we don't have the freely available data yet to put together. But basically, it's what a government is prepared to invest in each person's life. So I can't tell you the value of a statistical life of a Nigerian woman or a Nigerian child, as in what the government is prepared to invest in us. But I can tell you the cost of the loss of that life. It costs 150,000 to give Naira, that is, to give a pauper's burial to a Nigerian woman. Meanwhile, it also cost only 10,000 Naira to give her free antenatal care for the duration of her pregnancy. <coughs> it costs 150,000 to bury a Nigerian child because actually burial cost, it doesn't change according to your size. It's only the cost of the coffin that changes according to how much wood there is inside it. 150,000 to bury a Nigerian child. But it costs, in a public school, only 36,000 naira to educate that child. So what I've been doing is I've been begging governments in my country and even in Africa to make this investment for women and children. And even though I had a global outlook, and even though I had a global education, I'm an African woman. And the solutions that I'm proffering, they're African solutions and their impact is for Africa. But actually, with the research that I've done, actually we're ahead of the UK now, with our personal health record, because we actually put the mother and the child in one book. So there's no way that you can even miss anything that happened to the mother that would happen to the child. I hope that my own little story of how I started, because I'm probably the most unlikely activist on this earth, but I hope my story will inspire other people to share their knowledge. Because when they say, what is leadership? I personally don't think that you're born to leadership or you're groomed to leadership or even that you can be trained to leadership. I believe that leadership is how you deal with the challenges that you face in your life and the knowledge that you pick up from the way you deal with it and whether you squander it or whether you share it. I just hope that my little experience today can make a few people want to share their knowledge and want to drive Africa forward because nobody's going to do it for us anymore. We're going to do it for ourselves. I thank you very much for listening. I thank you, Chikwe, where are you, for inviting me. And um, Godspeed. Thank you.